Is individualism, historically speaking, a novel thing? Is it relatively recent? And if so, how different is it from how ancient people viewed themselves, and how exactly did it come about, especially in Western society? Well, the big book, Inventing the Individual, poses answers to all of those questions. Let me tell you what I thought. Welcome to Books and Big Ideas, what I'm reading, what I'm thinking about, with Joel Wentz. Okay, I have here Inventing the Individual, The Origins of Western Liberalism by Larry Seidentop. Um, typically, uh, before I get in my review, uh, sometimes what I do is take, on this channel, I take a look at books that are, uh, have some notoriety, that are, you know, maybe popular, uh, getting a lot of conversation, and I take a look at them just because they're well known. Other times I take a look at books that I, re that I, I suspect are less well known, but I really want to encourage people to look at. This is an example of the latter. This is a book that I don't know if a lot of people know about. I certainly had not heard about it before I picked it up. So just know at the, at the forefront, you know, this is going to largely be a positive review and I'm going to encourage people to read it. But I want to get in a little bit more about what the actual contents are. So, uh, so yeah, Inventing the Individual, let me tell you a little bit about the main idea, the research, the readability, and the reasonableness of it. Um, okay, so the main idea is pretty, captured pretty well in the title. The main idea is, according to Side and Top, uh, and I agree with him in this. Um, I agreed with him actually before I even picked up this book in broad strokes. Um, but the idea that we think of ourselves primarily as accountable individuals, individualism in kind of like a societal sense, uh, picturing ourselves primarily as individuals as opposed to members of groups, that's the big distinction, but individuals as opposed to members of groups, whether that group is a family or a tribe or something like that, or even a nation state. Uh, the idea that individuals are directly accountable and that leaders are also, that's a big, big piece of it, that leaders like kings or you know, presidents or whatever, prime ministers, now in our parlance, that even leaders of people are accountable individuals as well. Uh, that whole conception of humanity and how humans organize themselves and how humans function in the world, uh, th that whole way of thinking is, um, historically speaking, relatively new and also somewhat unique to the West, in a sense. Um, that's kind of a given in his argument, and he's more um, taking that as basically a given. He, he does kind of ground the argument in the first opening chapters, comparing us to the ancient world. But the main idea of the book is not that it happened, but how did it happen? How did that come about, historically and philosophically especially? How did we move from conceiving ourselves as group-based to conceiving ourselves primarily as individuals? Um, hence inventing the individual. And then he argues that that is a really prominent prominent thread that, that feeds into what would become Western, a Western specific kind of classical liberalism. Uh, so that's the main idea of the book. And he, and he starts, he roots it in from the ancient world, the ancient conception of the cosmos and the family and the, and, and the, and the state, even though that's an anachronistic term, uh, he starts there and then really goes through essentially almost 2000 years of human history uh, in about less than 400 pages. So that's the main idea. Uh, the research behind it, he, um, he pulls on, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is it Guizot, G-U-I-Z-O-T? I'm not sure if that's right. He pulls on historians like him. Uh, there's three or four major historians, Peter Brown's another big one, uh, that he pulls on pretty extensively. Um, and these are historians of kind of the West and Western culture and, and the, church, the history of the church, the Christian church specifically. He pulls on these historians, but, but he pulls really, really widely. And uh, one thing I loved about the research of this book, so first of all, he points very clearly to who's influenced his thinking. Um, but the other thing I loved, and I really love it when books like this do this, but for each chapter in the back of the book, there's a, there's a section of references for that chapter, but also a paragraph specifically pointing the reader to other resources on the topic of that chapter in particular. So there's a chapter on Augustine, for example, and he says, here are some great biographies on Augustine, here are some great thinkers on Augustine. Um, there's a chapter on Charlemagne, same deal. There's, you know, there's chapters that have to do with the Crusades and, and a lot of things about kind of the ways that the, the Western Europe changed and evolved. And each one has a chapter of further re reading and resources on that chapter and that topic specifically. And I love that. I absolutely love that when books do that. So big props on the research uh, in this book. Not only is the research pretty wide, pretty effectively pointed to and cited, uh, it also has in, like a treasure chest of further stuff to read. So I love that. Um, the readability of it. So uh, this is a big, big book. Uh, it's, it's thick. You know, I held it up a little bit ago. It's thick in the sense of page count, kind of, but it's actually kind of not thick because of the big swing it's taking. So to be covering such a 
swath of human history in less than 400 pages is pretty pretty uh, surprising. Um, the style is it's not it's not it's not dry academic, but it's also not popular popularly readable. Um, it's somewhere in between those two things. I did not find it stuffy or dry, but I also didn't find I, I found it a little dense in the style. I had to reread pages pretty regularly just to really sink into the argument that's unfolding and really grasp the he moves through such big phases of history so fast that it does take a little bit of rereading to, to really, I think, digest. But it's written well. It's written with a pretty light touch. So that, that's, a, that's a little bit somewhere in the middle. One other thing on the readability that I want to comment on, because this, for me, if you're a reader like me, then this is, this is also a big plus, is the chapters are short. <clears throat> I love short chapters, especially in these kinds of books that do tend to lean in the academic side. The chapters are short. Um, I love that because it really helps grasp the argument in kind of almost like smaller bites, so to speak. So uh, he did a great job in organizing the, the chapters under these topics that progress of the bigger argument, but also keeping them short and relatively easy to get through. Uh, so that's the readability, generally quite a readable book, especially considering the bigness of the argument, the size of the argument that he's making. Okay, finally, the reasonableness, uh, kind of my overall reaction to this book. Um, well, I said at the beginning of this review that I essentially agreed with the premise. I agreed with the notion that the West is a little strange with our individualism. Another book I thought of a lot was Joseph Henrik's um, book, The Weirdest People in the World, um, which I've reviewed actually on this channel. That, in some ways, it's a very different book, but in, in a lot of ways, it has a lot of the same premise, which is that uh, Westerners are strange and our concept of humans as primarily individuals. Um, but another major overlap between those two books, and the reason I thought of Henrik's book so much while I was reading this one, is because of the role of Christianity. Christian, Christianity as a philosophy and um, a teaching, but also the history of the church, specifically in a societal, geopolitical sense. So, um, inventing the, the Seidentop's book here um, is a, a large... It's not too much to say that this is, in, a, in, in some ways, a book of the history of the Christian church in Europe. Um, I have no idea what his faith commitments are, if there are, if he has any faith commitments. I don't know anything about him, really, on that personal side of things. Uh, so I don't know if he's writing at this from someone who's, you know, sympathetic to Christianity personally or not. I don't know. But it's a lot about the history of the church, a lot even about Paul's writings, a lot about how uh, early church writers like Augustine, um, Origen, and others talked about the individual Gregor of Nyssa. Um, there's a lot in there about the, the early church and church, Christian church history. So if you're, an, if you're already interested in that topic specifically, you're going to find a ton of it here, which was a little bit of a pleasant surprise to me. But Henrik's book also talks a lot about the impact of the Christian church in Western Europe and the conception of the individual. So there's really fascinating overlap there. Um, but I, I'm getting back into the content and I'm talking about my reaction. So I was primed to agree with it because I've already had a general sense of like, yeah, individualism is a strange thing. It does seem to be located in the history of the West and Western Europe. And it also does seem to have something to do with the trajectory of the Christian church. Um, those things all seem to be at play. Now, this book um, definitely had an impact on my paradigm and my thought process around all those arguments. And, I, and it definitely stretched me and pushed me in some directions, in really good ways. Um, first of all, a couple, a couple of my takeaways I just want to talk about here. First of all, the reach of the book, it really, it really roots in the ancient, couple chapters in the ancient world that do an effective job at talking about the conception of someone within their family and the kind of the religious connotations of that. Um, but he also stretches through Paul's writings all the way up uh, to kind of right after the post-Reformation era. So it's a, it's a really big kind of, kind of traipse through Western European history. Uh, and getting that from front page to last page, all in kind of one big gulp, is a really, really helpful big picture view. Uh, so I love that, and I think he's right about the, 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 the trajectory of things. Um, another takeaway, though, uh, that really um, was helpful for me and convincing and plausible for me is he basically, he basically talks about the history of Western Europe as, uh, he talks about the history of the development of Western Europe through feudalism and into more of a nation state mindset on one parallel track with another parallel track being the church, particularly the Catholic church under the authority of the centralized authority of the Pope. So what's fascinating about this book, and I think he, something he brings out that I've never really wrestled with that clearly before is the fact that 
while these different cultures, cultural groups and nation states were kind of starting to form identities like the Franks and then the German, the Germanics uh, and all, all of that, while those were all happening kind of in a little bit of a, their own groups, all the while there was this unified identity of the church that pervaded all of these groups in Western Europe that had its own identity under the Pope and its own doctrines that talked about people primarily as individuals. And so the development of that and the organization of the church that, per, that crossed all these boundaries in Western Europe, then in his argument fed back into how Western European rulers and monarchs, then how they thought about their own societies, their makeup, their organization, how to, t- how to, uh, talk about their subjects as individuals. So the kind of the, the parallel tracks of these nation states and and the church and how those things fed through each other, into each other and back and forth into each other and how that produces really unique kind of concoction of factors in Western Europe specifically and individualism being a current under all of that. Man, utterly fascinating and I f- very compelling and very, very persuasive and a very uh, distinct angle he brings into that whole bigger conversation about the history of humanity and the history of Western Europe specifically. Huge takeaway for me from this book. And I found it very, like I said, very, um, if not, I like, there's still things I'm maybe chewing on and wrestling with a little bit and digesting, but overall I found it very compelling, very, very persuasive. Another third thing I want to say that surprised me um, was I thought, so and this might, maybe this will intrigue you if you're a history reader. A lot of these books that talk about this topic and a, lot, and a lot of these books that make certain arguments about the development of human society and individualism and all that stuff and liberalism, a lot of them talk a lot about the Protestant Reformation, understandably so. And I thought this, the Protestant Reformation would figure largely into this book, but it, it, it almost doesn't, almost at all, surprisingly. I got to the end of the book and was shocked to get to like the last chapter and I was like I was thinking, he hasn't gotten to the Reformation yet, what's the deal here? But really what he's arguing is that, and it feeds into his argument very well, because what he's arguing is that these antecedents, these ideas, have existed for so long and were really like germinating in in Western European culture for so long that it's almost as if, he doesn't say this, but I took his argument to, I took took this out of his arguments to say like, the Reformation was essentially kind of waiting to happen. Um, There were so many prior cultural factors that were, had existed for so long and for so many centuries in the development of these Western European socio-political realities. It was almost just kind of a hotbed waiting for something like the Reformation to emerge. And so he doesn't talk about the Reformation as really causing or accelerating it much at all because it was kind of a just a natural, in his view, outcome of the individualism that had been at work for literally centuries at that point. Fascinating, and also very different from some other arguments that I've read. So I could talk more about this book, but those are just a couple key takeaways uh, on this. A lot about the history of the church, really good writing on the history of the church. I thought really, really thoughtful summaries of other thinkers, even people like Augustine to even more modern historians. A really big argument, a really compelling argument, very plausible, very persuasive, and especially in, in certain parts, um, really impacted my own thinking of this subject, and some, a subject that I've done a good bit of reading on. Uh, and so I have really no reservations about heartily recommending this book, Inventing the Individual. I think if you're interested in a lot of the other stuff I've reviewed in this channel, if you're interested in some of the ideas that I wrestle with, uh, if you're willing to do a little bit of work to get through a bit of a longer book and a bigger historical, socio-historical argument, um, you're going to get a lot out of plugging through Inventing the Individual by Larry Side and Top. So there you go. Those are my thoughts on that one. It got a little bit longer than I meant to, but it's a pretty, pretty big book and worth some serious thought and reflection. So um, as always, I hope you found something here uh, interesting, intellectually stimulating, something to provoke your own reflections. Um, and as always, thank you so much for watching.